In this lesson, we're going to continue broadening the scope of aromatic compounds that we understand by looking at aromatic compounds that contain one or more heteroatoms within the ring, what we call aromatic heterocycles. The introduction of heteroatoms instead of carbon creates some interesting issues and, and introduces some new concerns. For one thing, many heteroatoms bring lone pairs into the structure, and the question of whether a lone pair is or is not part of the pi system is an important one for structure and reactivity. Additionally, heteroatoms tend to be electronegative and tend to engage in resonance within the pi system. And so the question of whether an aromatic heterocycle is electron rich or electron poor comes up, even in unsubstituted cases, just by virtue of the fact that there's a heteroatom within the ring. The good news is that what we learned in the last lesson about electron donating and withdrawing groups by resonance is going to apply here as well. We can think of heteroatoms within rings as internal electron donating and withdrawing groups in order to assess whether a heterocycle is electron rich or electron poor. So we're going to look at that and we will start by focusing on two very important aromatic heterocycles, pyridine and parole, that are kind of good general examples of the types of aromatic heterocycles that we come across in terms of electron poor or electron rich. And we're going to close by focusing on the acid base properties of heterocycles. Whether a lone pair is basic or not relates to its status as part of the pi system or not, for example. So let's begin with an introduction to aromatic heterocycles. Why do we care about this class of molecules? Well, aromatic heterocycles actually come up a lot in both biochemical and non-biochemical contexts. On this slide, I focus on the biochemical applications, but aromatic heterocycles are found in non-biochemical, just plain organic applications across the board. One example of aromatic heterocycles that we find in nature in biochemistry are some side chains of the amino acids. So the side chain of tryptophan, for example, includes an aromatic heterocycle containing a nitrogen atom. And this is an example of what we call a fused heterocycle in which a heterocycle and another aromatic ring, here it's a benzene, share a bond. This is what we refer to as an indole. The amino acid histidine also features a heterocycle within its structure. This one contains two nitrogen atoms and it's referred to as an imidazole ring. Imidazole is interesting for a number of reasons, but one interesting question concerns the nature of these two nitrogens, both of which have lone pairs. Which nitrogen is more basic than the other? By the end of this lesson, you'll be able to answer this question straightforwardly. Perhaps the most famous example of aromatic heterocycles in biochemistry are the nitrogenous bases of DNA and RNA. Here I've shown the four nitrogenous bases of DNA, and all of these contain aromatic heterocycles. Cytosine and thymine consist of six-membered cycles, while adenine and guanine are examples of fused aromatic heterocycles consisting of a five-membered ring sharing a bond with a six-membered ring. And although I haven't highlighted them, the oxygens and nitrogens that decorate these structures as substituents are actually part of these pi systems as well. On the right-hand side of this slide, you can see a few more examples of important aromatic heterocycles that we'll come across in this lesson. What are the questions of interest when we look at an aromatic heterocycle? Well, one important question is, what makes these compounds aromatic exactly? Really, we know how to answer this question already, but as I mentioned in the introduction, the presence of lone pairs on the heteroatoms within these structures makes the question a little more interesting because we have to critically evaluate whether the lone pair is part of the pi system or not. And in a case like oxygen or sulfur, where we have two lone pairs, are both part of the pi system or is only one or is neither. And so the question about the role of the lone pairs is important in an aromatic heterocycle context especially. What can resonance reveal about aromatic heterocycles? Well, this is a, an important place where heterocycles differ from all carbon aromatic compounds. Resonance structures are going to start engaging lone pairs, potentially. Lone pairs that are part of the pi system, such as the lone pair in parole and one of the lone pairs in furan, are going to get involved in resonance structures. The linkages between the heteroatom and carbon will necessarily be polarized toward the heteroatom, since the heteroatom is going to be more electronegative than carbon. And that as well is going to give rise to some new resonance forms. For example, we could push this carbon-nitrogen pi bond onto nitrogen, generating a resonance structure in which carbon is positively charged. So resonance reveals a lot about the nature of aromatic heterocycles, especially whether they're electron-rich 
or electron poor. Following from that, connecting structure to reactivity, how do reactions of aromatic heterocycles differ from those of other compounds that contain heteroatoms or all carbon aromatic equivalents like benzene and polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. We won't add too much to say about this at the moment, but we're going to focus on acid-base chemistry here and we'll return to the question of the reactivity of aromatic heterocycles in reactions that are more typical of aromatics in a later lesson. Finally, the last thing I want to do before closing here is remind you of this slide, which shows us the different types of carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen atoms that show up within conjugated systems. Whether a pair of electrons is part of the pi system or not depends on whether it is within a p orbital in this orbital picture or not. And we've seen previously that we can reason from a Lewis structure to the orbital nature just by looking at the atom type, nitrogen for example, and the connectivity, the number of atoms connected. Here it's three. From that analysis alone, we can conclude that this lone pair, which is this lone pair, must be in a p orbital because it participates in resonance and it engages in orbital overlap with the p orbitals next door. It's going to be important to engage this understanding throughout this lesson to assess whether a lone pair is part of a pi system or not. Previously, we used these pictures to understand the pi electron count for evaluating whether a ring was aromatic or not. In this lesson, that's still going to be important to a degree, although we're not really going to come across any anti-aromatic heterocycles, as these would be horribly unstable. The other thing we're going to evaluate using these orbital pictures is the basicity of that atom. In particular, whether that lone pair can act as a base, in other words, be donated to an electrophile or to a proton or not. The general point, which I'll state here and we'll return to later, is that lone pairs that are part of the pi system, such as the lone pair of an N3 nitrogen, are not basic. They're wrapped up in resonance and delocalization within the ring in an aromatic pi system. And so they're much, much more stable than a lone pair in a hybrid in something that's non-aromatic something like a plain vanilla amine. The difference there is the nature of the orbital that houses the lone pair. Is it a pi orbital that's part of the aromatic pi system, or is it a hybrid? That's why this orbital understanding of the electrons within an aromatic heterocycle, both the pi system and the sigma system, is important for evaluating basicity.